All right. Um, I'm John Skinner from the University of Tennessee. I'm a professor here, and I'm also an extension apiculturalist. That doesn't mean I culture apes. It means I work with bees and beekeeping. Um, but I'm, I like all bees. Anything that pollinates, I'm all for. This particular webinar series it includes six different webinars over the next three months, two per month, one this week, one next week. Um, we're going to be talking about almond pollination today. Then we're going to talk about pollinating requirements and whatnot for high bush blueberries. And all these different webinars are going to basically look at different aspects of role of wild bees, honeybees, and other managed bees in supporting crop pollination and yield in those different crops, almond, blueberry, tree fruit, pumpkin, and watermelon. Uh, many of you in the, that are listening in probably have an interest in one or more of those crops, and I, I encourage you to, to sign up for the rest of the webinar series. Um, we're looking forward to doing this. These, all the people that are presenting are experts on that particular crop. They're all pollination ecologists. They're all involved in this integrated crop pollination project, which is really a, a very important one. And we encourage you to participate. If you've got questions, ask them as we go and we'll try to get to what we can as, as the webinar continues. And I'd like to introduce uh, Katharina Ullman. She basically is my co cohort in crime here and and basically she will introduce our speaker for today great thanks so much john and uh, that was a great introduction to the whole webinar series um as john said my name is kathleen Ullman. i work with the xerces society for invertebrate conservation as a crop pollination specialist and i also uh, work with the integrated crop pollination project that john talked about and uh, that teresa will touch on a little bit in her presentation um, we are really excited that teresa fitzinger is here to present on almond pollination today teresa is a research entomologist with the usda agricultural research service where her research team focuses on improving commercial scale use of alternative managed bees like blue orchard bees. Um, she's worked in a number of cropping systems, including almond, um, which she's worked in for six years. And her talk is entitled, Ensuring Almond Pollination. You can ask uh, questions throughout her talk, as, as we've mentioned before, using that question box uh, on your webinar screen. She won't be uh, necessarily answering questions as she goes during her talk, but we'll have a Q&A time at the uh, end of her presentation to get at all those questions. Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was that for those of you uh, on the webinar that are looking for certified crop advisor credits, um, you can get uh, 0.5 uh, crop management credits for this particular webinar, and we'll send out a link at the end of the webinar in that chat box uh, for you to uh, um, fill out your name and certified crop advisor number so we can make sure we get you uh, your credits. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Teresa, um, and uh, thanks everyone again for joining us today. Hi, so thanks Katharina and John and Mark for hosting this webinar today. Um, I hope that everybody can hear me just fine. This is a little bit out of my realm. I'm not used to giving webinars, but I'll see that I'll try to do a good job for you. So I have been working in the almond system for the past six years, and I'm going to share with you today what I understand about uh, almond production. And a key component of almond production is the ability to pollinate it. So uh, John, at the end of the webinar, may help me answer some more almond-specific questions if you have them, but together we'll, we'll give you a good education on this topic. So I want to first start by talking a little bit about Project ICP, which is Integrated Crop Pollination. And uh, that is a project that Katharina and myself have been uh, involved with for, uh, we're starting our fifth year. And about 20 different collaborators work on this, and we're looking at uh, bees that are pollinators, and those are managed bees, such as honeybees, and also bumblebees and blue orchard bees, as well as wild bees that occur from the surrounding environments. And in order to support these managed 
alternative and, and common bees, as well as the wild ones. It's sometimes a wise idea to ensure that there are, uh, there's ample habitat for them for nesting spaces as well as floral resources. So we uh, are interested in learning more about habitat enhancements. Furthermore, there are horticultural practices that may uh, improve the abundance and diversity of pollinators for some cropping systems. And those kind of practices may be um, whether or not to till or to, um, to, or not to till so that you can have ground nesting bees and places for bumblebees to nest. And then of course there's pesticide stewardship, meaning that we need to protect the bees uh, that are doing the pollinations from any harmful effects of the pesticides that are necessary for crop production. So overall, the integrated crop pollination system is to provide strategies to provide re reliable and economic uh, pollination of crops and to disseminate all this information to uh, stakeholders. So on with California almonds. What are we doing there? Well, let's have a little background on the almonds. In California, they're the top agricultural export with a 2014 gross, gross production value of over $6 billion. It's the largest exported US specialty crop, with most of it being shipped abroad. Specialty crops are not corn, cotton, or canola, or, or things like that. So this is where the specialty crops are those uh, commodities that aren't uh, some of those top three that we think of as, as big US crops. But almonds aren't native to the Americas. They're um, from the Middle East, uh, you know, around uh, this area here, and uh, northern Africa, and also in India. And since they're not native, pl native plants to the Americas, uh, they really haven't uh, uh, evolved with the native ecosystem. And so they bloom very, very early in the spring in the kind of Mediterranean uh, areas of California. And there's no other bloom that really is available for bees at that time. But on top of that, most native bees aren't available either. And so there's, not, um, there's usually not many bees out that can pollinate as wild pollinators. And even the managed pollinators that we bring into the system, such as honeybees, are not native to America. But even they are not exactly timed to be out and foraging this time of year. So it's kind of a difficult crop. It's grown in the Central Valley of California where most crop production is done, and there are 30 different varieties, and some are soft shells and some are hard shells. We can shell them by soft shells. But the acreage of almonds grown in California has grown dramatically for over the last about 15 years. And in 2016, it's projected that there'll be 900,000 acres of bearing uh, trees, meaning that those will actually produce almonds there's more acreage that will have been planted. So that's, you know, nearing a million acres of almonds in California alone. And this crop needs a pollinator. So it's, in most cases, uh, a vector is required to transfer pollen between trees. And I'll talk more about that, uh, that's been done by, the pollination done by honeybees as well as blue orchard bees. It becomes one of the world's largest pollination event. And the honeybees have been uh, given uh, a value of over 14, almost $15 billion um, in, in what they provide to as a pollination service to this crop. So let me explain how almonds are produced. They bloom in early uh, to mid-February, so it's just around the corner. My team's getting ready to go out there for a, a big pollination event. And the trees bloom in mass and just Fields and just miles and miles and miles of almonds are in bloom at one time. It's actually quite spectacular and beautiful and it smells really nice. But what's very interesting about almonds is that every other row is a different variety of uh, almonds. So if the target variety, the one you're most interested in growing, is nonpareil, as shown here, it will be every other row. And then it will be surrounded by pollinizer, pollinizer varieties which in this case I've uh, written down as Padre and Monterey. Honestly, I don't know the varieties of these particular trees, but these are examples of, this is the kind of example of, of the system that we work in. So these pollinators will bloom shortly, shortly uh, uh, just a little bit out of sync with the 
target uh, variety such that the target variety will be surrounded by kind of an early blooming and a later blooming uh, variety so that it can be ensured the most pollination as possible. Later, and not too much later, really just two to three weeks after the first bloom, most of the bloom will wane and then the petals fall off and the leaves come on. So um, at this time, then there's, there's no other floral resources on the trees or in the orchards. The fruits develop from March to, to June and then the shells start to hard, harden and the kernels form on the inside. Late in the summer, they start to harvest these almonds using these giant mechanical shakers that grab the trees and, and shake them so that the nuts fall onto the ground. And then the nuts are swept into rows, as you see here on the left. And then they can be collected uh, off the ground by mechanical harvesters. And this is also how we sometimes sample yield, is by picking up uh, parts of these rows near tr sample trees. Now you can see here that there's really nothing between the trees. Part of the production of almonds is is the uh, use of the bare ground underneath the trees as a, uh, a way, a means to pick up the nuts off of the ground. So you can't have a lot of vegetation in there. Then the uh, process of cleaning up the almonds uh, after harvest is done and they're sorted and, and shelled and then uh, sent away. But there's still some management that goes on in the orchards, big terrible machines like this one are sent through the orchards to prune the trees and to keep them clipped back so that uh, the trees will always be bearing good fruit and then the um, machinery can run up and down the aisles. So orchard management also includes the use of chemicals to control different types of pests. So this time of year, the growers will be out putting um, uh, herbicides to keep those orchard floors uh, clear of weeds, although some will have some um, grasses that grow in there, but they are uh, annual grasses and will be gone by late summer. Uh, they treat for scales and mice during this time of year. And then when bloom comes on, in especially the central and northern parts of the Central Valley, um, fungus is a problem. And so they will do more preventative sprays for uh, those kinds of problems that will uh, harm the fruit later and, and harm the trees themselves. But in the southern part of the valley, this is the fungicides usually are not sprayed. And actually that's where my team uh, does most of their work. And then during the fruit development time and around harvest, more insecticides are used to uh, prevent uh, infestation by certain um, moths, such as the uh, navel orange worms and uh, pink uh, peach twig borers. borers, uh, borers. And so um, a lot of chemicals get sprayed in the orchards as necessary to produce the crop, but only a few of them are sprayed during bloom. So let's understand a little bit more about how uh, pollination takes place. So let me show you the reproductive parts of the flower. Um, this is an just open flower, and you can see here uh, one of the anthers, and it is not yet dehissed, and dehissing means that it's just kind of opened up and kind of shed the, it kind of loosened up the pollen spores out of these packages that occur on the anthers. And then in the center of the flower, not yet showing here in this picture, is uh, a stigma that will come up and, uh, and need to gather those pollen grains. And I'll show you a little more about that in the next picture. But I also want to point out in this flower that at the base of these uh, uh, anthers, you can, is where the uh, nectar will puddle. And this is what bees also go looking for. And uh, in a sense, if there are pesticide sprays, is a place where uh, pesticides can gather if on a fresh flower. So thinking about bee behavior, um, what we can see here on the left is a honeybee that is uh, collecting pollen from this flower. And between her legs is the stigma that I mentioned before. It has grown up through those anthers and is there uh, available to be touched by uh, the uh, pollen bearing part of the bee's leg, which is the pollen basket. And here on the right, you can see the stigma clearly extended out from those anthers. And what needs to happen are the pollen grains needed to be deposited out on the tip of this stigma. And it needs to be pollen grain from a different variety 
of almond than the uh, than what the flowers on. So it's important how the bee uh, visits these flowers and moves from tree to tree and uh, between rows and not just within rows. Um, the anatomy of a, the bee is important for how this pollen can be delivered. So I want to compare for you the honeybee and the blue orchard bee, both ex excellent pollinators for almonds. On the left, you see the honeybee and this big mass of pollen that's collected on her hind leg. And that's where all honeybees and a lot of other bees collect pollen. But the honeybee collects it with, uh, by moistening, moistening it into these pellets on the leg. And so the pollen is a little less readily available than when a blue orchard bee collects the pollen, which she does on her scopa, which is on the underside of her belly. I'll show you this a little better in another picture. But notice how the blue orchard bee's body is kind of wiggling all over the top of those anthers and where the stigma would be. Because blue orchard bees uh, collect pollen and nectar in the same foraging trips, whereas honeybees often are only nectar foragers or only pollen foragers. So their bodies don't always connect the way are, that is necessary for pollination. I wanna show you just a little more about the blue orchard bee since it may be a new bee to you and there'll be a whole other seminar on this uh, at the end of the series. But here on the top left, you can see that the blue orchard bee is putting her face down into the face of the flower to collect the nectar. But here in another angle at the bottom, uh, she is collecting that nectar and her, the underside of her abdomen is coming in direct contact with the stigma and she would have collected pollen on that under her belly there. And you can see again in the top right that her body position is great for pollination. And on the bottom right, you can see a blue orchard bee at a nest cavity, which is what they nest in. And she's covered in pollen and she's uh, uh, crawling out of her nest having just delivered a big bundle of pollen in there. And here's a, just a little more on the management of uh, blue orchard bees and almonds. We can hang boxes up or we can hang these laminate uh, wood structures up for them to nest in. Um, and they go out and they, every bee that's released is the queen. She'll go out and gather nectar and pollen for her brood and make her own nests. So it's a little different system and I hope you join, um, join me later in the, the year to explore more about the blue orchard bee. But what is it that uh, bees need from the flowers? Why do they bother visiting? Well, they need the pollen and nectar for raising their brood. And so you can see on the right, the honeybees have collected pollen and nectar, which they store in different cavities. And then they bring and they deliver to larvae in the nest. So it's called progressive provisioning because they're not fed one lump sum. They're visited many times by their sisters in the hive. Whereas blue orchard bees, like I said before, each uh, female bee is a queen. She provisions her own nest, such as this reed on the bottom of the screen. And uh, she uses mud to partition between cells. And within each cell, she puts nectar and pollen and she lays an egg. She lays the female eggs in the back and the male eggs in the front because the males are smaller and they'll hatch first. So they'll chew their way out of the mud plug. And, um, and then their, their uh, sister females will follow. Uh, so not only do the bees need pollen and nectar for raising a brood, but they need clean, uncontaminated water for uh, in honeybee hives, cooling the hive and mixing with the food. And then for blue orchard bees, they need the water for making their, um, their little mud partitions. If it's too dry, they can't make these partitions. So back to the honeybees and their uh, use in almonds. Honeybees are stocked at two colonies per acre. And if there's 9 million acres, or I'm sorry, 900,000 acres of almonds to be pollinated, that means 1.8 million colonies of honeybees are needed just for the Central Valley of California for the month of February. So many, many trucks will load up, at load, load up with honeybee colonies. Each one of these is a colony and be driven out to California nonstop to get them there so that they're not too stressed out and starving. Then they get dropped off into things like this. So bee yards, or the bee yards looking out in the, one of the valleys in California, this is Southern California. And what's pretty dramatic from this picture is there looks to be nothing flowering at this time. So these colonies will have to be serviced with some sort of uh, syrup water, or pollen patties that will supplement them 
for brood production and sustenance at this time before they get placed in with the almonds. Here you see another shot a little closer up of the same uh, situation. And you have to remember that honeybees are very managed uh, animals and there's a lot of challenges for them and you probably have heard of the colony collapse disorder, which there's no real given cause. It's kind of like a complex of, of many problems such as the pests that infect them, the varroa and tracheal mites, hive beetles and wax moths, pathogens that they share, especially in situations when they're all brought together for one common event. They have viruses, fungus, and bacteria. There are pesticides sprayed in the crops they visit, visit in the, their own hives to control the pests in the first line there. And also in the environment, the honeybees will fly up to five miles to seek nectar and pollen. And they have to have nutrition, and a lot of times those resources aren't available in the amounts they need or in the diversity that they may need. And there's interactions among all these factors. So a lot of work and maintenance goes into taking care of these honeybees. And especially since CCD started, which was around the, in 2006 when uh, beekeepers started to see about a 30% winter loss of their colonies, the price just went up dramatically. It easily doubled. And now um, it's around, like last year, the prices, contracted price for renting the hives was uh, around $200, and again this year. So $170 to $200, depending on the quality of the hives you're getting them from and how many. So um, the Almond Board of California uh, kindly uh, supplied me a few slides and I kind of uh, adjusted them and added a few shots of my own in here. But um, part of what they recommend today is that you um, provide supplemental forage for your honeybees. And this is an ICP kind of concept. And that gives uh, natural nutrition before and after almond bloom if you can get flowers to grow at a time when the bees are present for almond pollination. And so uh, what the Almond Board funded research is finding is that the almond bloom provides forage that seems to increase the survivorship of hives that have access to them. And also some work with UC Davis has shown that the forage doesn't compete with the almonds for pollination and the bees will go to the almonds for, first and only after the bloom subsides do the bees really switch over to using the other forage. And some honey beekeepers will even contract with a grower for a reduced price if they provide forest, forage for their bees. Blue orchard bees can also uh, benefit from floral enhancements and this is some of the work that my team does. And this is you see a one acre strip in Southern California where we work. And you can see over to the right that the almond orchard is finished blooming, but there's still a lot of bloom provided for the orchard bees. And this is the, these are the species we use in the mix. Um, this work we did in collaboration with UC Davis and actually they planted these plots. And what you can see the benefit to the blue orchard bees is that um, uh, when you have a setup where you have floral enhancements off to the side, and you have areas where blue orchard bees are, these brown dots, then if you measure um, the, uh, the blue orchard bee nesting in these areas, we find that both in two different years we did the work in 2015 and 2016, that after almond bloom, which was uh, about the 7th of March, when it ceased, we still had an increase in the number of nests made in the boxes, nest boxes we provided, that were uh, nearest to these floral enhancements. And even far away, we saw some increase after bloom, but not nearly as much as those bees that had access to those floral enhancements. So to sustain blue orchard bees in almond systems, it's a great idea to have these enhancement plots. The Almond Board of California also has uh, some good references for people to um, download for free from their website such as the management practices for California almonds. And they also suggest that there be a good communication chain between the beekeeper and his broker to the person that is leasing their bees and a, a nego with uh, negotiation, negotiating prices and, and uh, how the system will work, but also with the farm manager, the person who's on the ground getting the job done, who has to deal with pest control and getting the orchard sprays. So a good communication will help to safeguard both the crop and the bees. And there are other measures that uh, 
one can take, such as having a, a, a real, an exact plan that outlines what uh, pest, mater pest control materials will be used, and, uh, and if the bee creeper wants to remove the bees at any point in time to help uh, make sure that the bees aren't exposed to anything that's gonna be terribly toxic to them, but necessary for the crop. And there's some other um, publications, such as this one, How to Reduce Bee Poisoning, that can be downloaded for free. And it's not only about honeybees, but other bees as well, because there are different sensitivities between the bees. It's also wise to uh, uh, spray at the appropriate times to avoid contacting the bees and the pollen. So if you can avoid it, don't spray during bloom. But if you have to, especially those, pest, those fungicide applications, they should occur in the late afternoon or in the evenings. And uh, and that means that because um, the bees will have gone back to their hives or into their nesting tubes. Uh, but also the bees pretty much strip out all of the pollen by the afternoons in these almond uh, orchards. So uh, there's not much uh, pollen left to contaminate uh, later in the afternoon. But if you wait till too close to the morning, like you're so late at night that it's almost morning, it, uh, the fungicides won't have time to have dried or will contaminate the newly puddled nectar. So uh, that timing is actually pretty important. And uh, one should never spray directly on beehives or the nesting sites of blue orchard bees. Uh, if you can turn off the nozzles to avoid that, that's always good. One other thing about almond pollination is that there are some trees that are being developed that are self-compatible. So that means that one variety can pollinate itself. But that doesn't mean that they don't need pollinators though. So uh, you'd still need to use probably one honeybee hive per acre, but those honeybees wouldn't have to travel across rows to get the pollination job done. They just have to go from flower to flower, even on the same tree. And it would also mean that at harvest time, instead of harvesting three varieties, which would be the target variety plus the two pollinizers, there would just have to be one harvest because the whole field could be harvested at once. It's all the same variety. And that's what some of the outlook is for almond production in California. But right now, there's only a little over 5,000 acres compared to that 900,000 um, of the conventional system so far. So kind of summarizing everything, um, from an IP, ICP perspective, we want to look at management strategies for, uh, that we can integrate with almond pollination and production. And that comes from understanding the crop needs so knowing that there you know, needs to be a vector that moves pollen across rows, not just within rows. Understanding what the pollinator likes, the preferences for floral resources, its behavior on the flowers, it, the body parts of the, of the bees that make pollination possible, and what those bees are susceptible to, such as lack of moisture or, or pesticides that are sprayed. And they need to have the resources uh, for uh, nesting and for brew production. And we need to develop further the, not just IPM, integrated pest, pest management approaches, but integrated pest and pollinator management approaches and other practices that can safeguard bees and uh, assure that they will be there for the next uh, pollination event. And in order to do all of this efficiently, we need to understand the economic value and viability of the pollinators that we choose to use in almonds and what's necessary to accommodate them. So with that, I think I can uh, just come to the end here and, and have time for a lot of questions, but I wanna thank all the people involved in the Integrated Crop Pollination Project and this many of the people you see here from a team meeting, but also TP, my team uh, that works at the, um, at the Bee Lab and uh, a lot of the slides you saw were taken by uh, some of my crew that are in the field every year working on this project. But lastly, before we go to questions, I would like to put up this slide to remind you of uh, what John said at the beginning, that there are more webinars coming your way and the next one will be January 31st on highbush blueberries. So um, please keep joining us for this series. And I certainly thank you for your attention and hope you I uh, got something out of that presentation and I'll be happy to take some questions. Katharina, you, you're on mute. 
Thanks. Thanks. Sorry about that. I was pressing the wrong unmute button. Sure. Thanks so uh, much for that great presentation, uh, Teresa. Um, uh, so if people have questions, go ahead and put them in the uh, question and answer box. Um, or uh, feel free to um, have conversations in the chat box. Um, you may have said this, Teresa, but uh, one question is uh, to what it, if, if someone is considering using, for example, Blue Orchard bees, would they end up uh, adjusting their honeybee stocking rate, or, or how do you actually integrate Blue Orchard bees into a system where you're already using honeybees? Right, so uh, we are looking at that this very year. Um, you could do half stocking, we have done, and you could do half a stocking rate of honeybees and blue orchard bees. And the, the practice of that right now would be one honeybee hive per acre and 400 female blue orchard bees per acre. Uh, you can separate the blue orchard bees as individuals and males and females, and you can actually deliver them in that way. Um, however, we're not sure if you could even do a better job of pollinating beyond maybe even what the market knows it could do by having both honeybees and blue orchard bees. And that's probably the system that we'll look at this year, just because it's almost impossible to, in the vastness of almond orchards and the number of honeybees out, you can't really just put one hive per acre out in systems because honeybees will just go wherever they want to. But right now, um, if you were just gonna use blue orchard bees, it would be about 800 to 1,000 females per acre. However, um, we believe that if we can do a little better job of sustaining the bees in the orchards and, and maintaining them there using some um, spray on lure we developed and, um, and some other techniques of how to uh, distribute nest boxes within the orchards that maybe that number would come down. And uh, so we're still investigating that a bit, but right now the stocking density that's recommended is a complementary uh, interaction of pollinators using one hive of honeybees and 400 females per acre for the blue orchard bees. Good question. Thanks. Thanks so much, Teresa. There's um, a couple of more uh, questions related to um, alternative managed bees. And then uh, there's also a question in the chat box related to um, uh, uh, planting pollinator forage and uh, price discounts related to that. But uh, starting off with uh, the alternative managed bees, um, Jeffrey Jarvis asks, are there uh, commercially available uh, bee boxes to encourage blue orchard bee communities? And if not, do you have information on how to build them on a DIY basis? Right, okay. So um, DIY basis, I would look at the, uh, just Google Logan Bee Lab. And in there, there's some, um, uh, uh, I think under research events. Anyway, one of the tabs, it, it shows you how to build a little blue orchard bee box. But so if I just Google uh, uh, how to manage blue orchard bees. That's a booklet that's downloadable from uh, Sustainable Agriculture that will describe to you the dimensions for nesting cavities, which you can make of cardboard straws or um, wood or, or layers of wood smashed together called laminates. Um, right now, there are some uh, Blue Orchard Bee providers who also provide some nesting substrates, and I don't want to promote any one than the other, but if you just kind of Google Blue Orchard Bees for sales, a lot of those websites will come up. But for the exact kind of boxes that we're using in the orchards, which are the corrugated plastic ones, um, those we're special ordering right now, and no one is commercially selling those as Blue Orchard Bee boxes, but there is a, a company in California that makes those. I think that, I think that got that <laughs> answered. Great. And then um, there's also a question about um, experience using commercial bumblebees. Um, I'm assuming, um, maybe Juan, when, um, when you were asking this question, were you thinking about almonds specifically or were you thinking about all crops? But maybe to begin with, Teresa, you can uh, let us know uh, what you know about commercial bumblebee, bumblebees within the almond context. Right. So um, there have been inquiries uh, about testing 
colonies of bumblebees that are uh, commercially produced for almond pollination, but the industry is just not there yet. Um, one of the problems is that it would be an open field event and the pollinators that are available for the, the bumblebee pollinators available for the West are, um, are just in a new industry. The species are being developed for open field pollination, but um, the Eastern species, which is Bombus impatiens, is uh, not allowed for open pollination in California because we don't want to mix up the Eastern and Western species. Um, but the other thing about the bumblebees naturally occurring in almonds, although they're a spring related bee and they fly in colder weather, usually at that time of year, if there were bumblebees present, they'd mostly just be queens because they have to build up a foraging um, uh, population within the hive over the course of the season. So early in the season, you only have bumblebee queens that are foraging. So there's really not that many of them out compared to like honeybees or another uh, uh, managed bee you could put out. Great, thank you so much, Teresa. So there's also a question in the chat box uh, related to um, uh, planting pollinator forage. And the question is how large and common are price discounts for planting pollinator forage? And um, uh, I'd say for, for those in the chat box, if you have experience with that too, feel free to, to chime in there too. But Teresa, do you have any uh, sense of that? Yeah, so I, I would say if today it's kind of expensive because because those um, floral plots that we've been using are kind of are California native plants. And this is still an area open for research. I think the Xerces has a lot of uh, information in some of their pamphlets and on their websites, but these are kind of just their specialty seeds right now. Um, I'm trying to think per acre, you know, I'd hate to say, cause I don't know it off the top of my head, but that's the kind of evaluation we're gonna be doing this year is to, for preparing uh, beds for floral enhancements and then what species are actually really the most beneficial to have. Maybe we could reduce the number of species of flowers. Um, that would make it all much more affordable. And, and this is a, a goal of ours is to find out what makes the most practical sense for growers. So I think that after this year, we'll have more information on that. The other idea would be if you're gonna plant these floral enhancements, if they're annuals, do they, uh, come back on their own readily? Or do you have to really spend that much every year? Or do they start sustaining themselves somewhat? So I would say I don't have a good answer for that yet. And do you know of any beekeepers giving uh, discounts for growers that are um, planting forage? You know, I don't, I don't know those people. That information was from the On the Board of California. And I don't have any um, uh, working relationships with the honey beekeepers who, who do that kind of work. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I personally don't know of any beekeepers either, um, Peyton, that are um, uh, giving discounts for um, growers that are putting in uh, pollinator forage. Um, in terms of cost share programs, I know that the USDA NRCS provides some cost share programs for people wanting to put in plantings. Um, but yeah, so we can't necessarily answer the second part of your question, which is how do they compare? How, how do those discounts for forage plantings compare with uh, um, uh, getting additional frames? Um, and then in terms of uh, the, the last question from Kate and Teresa was, is there any good source for getting representative uh, pollination contracts? So um, I'm guessing this is like a, a pollination contract template. Hmm. You know, I think those kind of resources are provided with um, the Almond Board of California on their website and that, that and maybe in that um, handbook that they provide, the best management practices. I think that would be a good place to start. There's, I know there's a couple online too. We'll try and get them uh, into the chat box for you, uh, Peyton. Um, we have two other questions uh, that have come up on the Q&A box. One is with, um, in terms of providing food, um, can you just give the bees some extra syrup? Um, is that enough? I think no, because I know out there they are concerned with getting uh, them those, the uh, commercially available pollen patties. There's a few different kinds, I believe. It's just so early in the year. Um, it's not like you're just sustaining the the current colony members, but they need to grow the uh, the bee brood. 
and coming out of just coming out of winter that's hard to do without the pollen present and even if the artificial pollen is not the best it's still helping the you know get that job done while they're waiting for the almond to bloom um, and then uh, we also have a question uh, asking, do Africanized bees attack orchard bees? You know, um, I don't know because that, uh, the Africanized bees aren't up into that, that part of California that I know of. I know that they are in Southern California. Is that who just said no, John? John, I, yeah. I'd say no to that and yeah. easily, quickly no. You get, you really get a chance to say no to anything. Oh. <laughs> I would say that. I also have an example of a pollination contract on my website. Oh. If you go to B, if you just Google UTK bees, it'll come up and look in the publication session and it's how to make a pollination contract. Great. And there's also, if you ask, um, probably ask Mustin, but give me well. He's at UC, he's retired from UC Davis, right? Yes, he's still very active though. He's probably listening in. Okay. So yeah. anyway, uh, but that, that would be sources that you can get it from. Yeah, and I would say the other thing about blue orchard bees and, and honeybees in general is that they don't interact in a negative way. Even then, if you put nest boxes near where there are honeybee hives, you still don't see any negative interactions going on where they're each doing their own foraging thing. You know, nobody's visiting each other's uh, realms and so i think it's a pretty nice situation to have both uh, pollinators at the same time um there's also a question um related to stocking densities um uh, peyton is asking whether stocking densities increase as trees per acre have risen hmm you know, I, it probably depends on who you are. I know that some orchardists uh, have gone, I've seen them go below two, two per acre and I've, got, I've seen them do more than two per acre at the same, uh, the same company that we work at year after year. I think it uh, depends on their economic resources. But uh, John, do you know more about that? Well, I, I would say a lot of times we get hung up with how many colonies. It's how strong the colonies are and how many foragers they actually have. And the price actually varies uh, by that. If they have big full colonies with more frames of brood and more industrious, they get more money for them. So it encourages the beekeepers to get the biggest bang out of this and have better strong colonies. A big strong colony will out, outperform five little ones. So you know, they, but the, and the industry is very good at making sure those colonies are strong enough. You can't just, you, you won't be, be asked to come back if you provide weak colonies for these growers. Right. And another thing I guess that affects pollination uh, in that sense is how many good foraging days you have. If it's uh, rainy spring weather, the bees just can't get out and do their job. The blue orchard bees might be more likely to go out on a kind of a bad day than, than honeybees, but in general, you're going to um, lose out on some of those pollination services if the uh, weather is bad and the, the flowers keep developing and, and move past their chance to get pollinated and the bees are sitting in the hives. But on like good sunny days, the bees will be out doing their job. So we have uh, two other questions that came up in the question box. Um, the first is, what is the status of pollen applied using aerial sprayers? Is it resulting in adequate pollination? I have only heard about this. John, do you know about it? No, I, I don't. That's out of my knowledge okay. uh, area. So okay. I can't really answer that one. Okay, well, my postdoc, uh, Natalie, just recently was at a, a cherry meeting and met the people who do these, uh, you know, they, they pollinate with these blowers and they um, take, they cut anthers from one variety and they spray it on another. And she told me just from a conversation she had yesterday that they're, uh, they think they've got it nailed down to where it's going to work great, but they're not advertising yet. So they're going to do some more testing, but it's something that's definitely being talked about at meetings. So stay tuned, I guess. There was uh, also for those of you who read Western Farm Press, there was an article about that 
uh, on January 18th if you want to look it up. Um, I can try and get that into the chat box uh, uh, as well for you. Um, we also have a question of how many pollen grains are needed to effectively pollinate a flower to ensure that set? Oh, I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, I don't think it's, I think you just need one good one that gets all the way down in there, but I am not absolutely sure. Uh, and even that pollen tube growth, uh, so if the pollen grain gets onto the stigma, it's got to grow a tube that reaches down into the ovule. And uh, weather affects that, you know, so the variety of uh, pollen and the weather does affect that. But the, I think the more grains that you get onto that stigma, the the higher the likelihood that it's going to be successful. Um, but I don't know if it just takes one or I, I think it does just take one, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, and I, we can, I, I've got a good paper that we can link to the to answer that question. It just takes one, but obviously it, so. be, it also, it, it makes a difference if, if the pollen is viable, the bee is carrying and it has to be from a different cultivar. So they can't self pollinate from the same tree, for example. It has to be from the pollinizer variety that is a like the pollen donor. And a, a good a, a honeybee with pollen on it, uh, and, and or uh, an orchard bee could probably easily fit it with just one visit. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it does depend, like Trace, like you said, on the way the bee is foraging. If it's a honeybee and it's a pollen foraging honeybee, they are more efficient than nectar foragers, uh, and it look and blue orchid bees are efficient because their particular mass is on their abdomen, and it comes easily in contact with the um, with the stigma. Great. And, um, are there? Oh, we have another. Yeah. So there's a question just about videos. Uh, uh, the videos for this webinar series will be available at a later date, except for this one. This one, unfortunately, we, we were not able to record uh, to be posted at a later date. Are there any other questions for Teresa? Does having a diversity of pollinators cause uh, more hopping around between blooms in a way that benefits pollination? Yeah, so there is a paper that was put out uh, by the, um, the group from UC Davis. Uh, it's, uh, Claire Britton did the work, and they caged some trees, and they put honeybees in some cages, blue orchard bees in others, and a mix in the, the third scenario. And where they had a mix, they had more efficient um, pollination to the effect that the pollen tubes were delivered correctly and, um, and grew and and created fruit set where they had both species. And there's other research that's shown that having uh, a mix of bees, bees and other bees causes uh, more efficient pollination. Now how that exactly works is the mechanism is not abundantly clear. And, uh, but we have already seen in situations where we've had just sections of almond orchards that have uh, blue orchard bees added to the regular stocking rate of honeybees that the fruit set is much greater where the blue orchard bees are present. Uh, it doesn't always translate in more nut yield. So in a sense, that's like the, the trees can get pollinated more effectively and start producing fruit in, uh, that would be higher yields where blue orchard bees are present with honeybees. Um, but uh, maybe with a different kind of orchard management, those trees could hold on to all that fruit instead of drop some of it so that there's a higher yield overall. And that's what we're kind of exploring this year. I think one of the potential mechanisms would be that, and I don't know if it, it applies strictly to almonds, but in other crops, is that a lot of native bees work faster than honey bees do when they're in a flower. And if uh, a native bee lands on a flower that a honey bee is, is, is on, it, it kind of gets the bee to move. And that creates more movement of pollen in the crop in some things, like sunflower and a few others. Uh, I think populations of bees and the number of foragers you have out there, regardless of, of whether they're honey bees, or blue orchard bees, or another native, the more you have, the individual bees will stimulate the others to get out of the way. There's no fight, there's no problem, 
but I think it encourages it encourages movement just by contacting in the flower. Yeah, and I heard another another interesting theory from Claire Kremen, and it was more or less just a theory, is a, uh, a bee like the blue orchard bee that's uh, promiscuous, it's, it's all over the place. They zoom, zoom, zoom around. They don't really go down a row or stay within a tree, but they also have all this loose dry pollen and it kind of gets everywhere all over the flower, right? But then if a honeybee comes along and she's very systematic and she's very disciplined and she comes around and she gets kind of contaminated with all that crazy multi varieties that that blue orchard bee has left behind. But she systematically goes from flower to flower to flower on the same tree, but she may be contaminated in a sense with a bunch of varietal pollen that the orchard bee left behind, but she delivers it systematically to a lot more flowers. So that's another interesting thought, but it's yet unproven. Yeah, well, in, in bumblebees, that's a similar thing with blueberries. And I think okay. the speaker next week will, uh, Rufus will probably address that, mm -hmm. uh, as well as with low bush blueberries and rabbit eye. Okay. Uh, this buzz pollinated by a bumblebee, but then honeybees move the pollen after it's been released by the bumblebee. So the yes. several species really make this work. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Teresa. I'll pass it over to John uh, to wrap up this webinar because um, uh, we've hit about uh, the end of the hour. Great. But thank you. Thank you again, Teresa, for all your uh, all the information you've shared with us today. You're all very welcome. Okay, we do have a poll at the end of the webinar that we'd like the participants to look at. Can we put that one up? Yep, we can. In fact, I will launch that poll now. So our attendees should be seeing that. If you take a, just a few seconds and uh, give us a little feed, feedback, that'll uh, that'll help us let us know if we're doing a good job and uh, if we need to make any changes going forward. So we'll give everyone just a few seconds to, to do thank that. You. Thank you very much, panelists. Um, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, yeah. Katharina. And Mark, you were excellent as a coordinator of this, uh, this webinar. We thank all those of you that tuned in. Please tune in um, next week for another exciting webinar on pollinating high bush blueberries. These bring bigger berries. Rufus, Rufus Isaacs at Michigan State University. I look forward to listening to that one. Me too. And for those of you that want uh, certified crop advisor credits, uh, we just put in the link into the chat box. It'll bring you to a Google form that will ask you for your name and certified crop advisor number. Um, uh, so if you're looking for credits, go ahead and fill it out using the link in the uh, Zoom webinar chat box. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll just take a minute. I'm still getting people responding to the poll. Uh, let's take another. 30 seconds or so before we shut that down. Teresa, I'm glad we're, we were able to give our, our technical uh, difficulties figured out there. <laughs> no kidding. That was scary. Even my cell phone was dying down there. I couldn't send stuff to him. So, yeah, that room's just haunted or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think we're, we're finished up. Thanks, th thanks, everyone, and we'll see you all again next week. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you now.